I'm going to be showing really small pictures, very low on the screen. So if anyone wants to come down, um, and hopefully we can get this more into the conversation at the end rather than another. Uh, but let's see. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, initially, I um, was going to talk about a project called Fixperts, which we did in the morning. but. Um, Following yesterday and some conversations, um, I think the the um, would be good to open up a bit out of uh, the subject of open design, and therefore a closing note is probably the hardest point to do that. But um, I don't know. We 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 heard amazing and so amazing uh, projects along the the last two days, and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled because I come from a slightly different territory, not in open design, following it, very excited about it and some of it. Um, but also, to some extent, a lot of times it seems like a lazy option for some people. Um, it's something to join now. It's something that um, to be together with a lot of people collaborating is also a way of hiding sometimes. Um, so I'd like to raise a, a, a question related to that, which is to do with what kind of time are we really in? Because everyone here is very excited about open design, open uh, innovation, collaboration, making, and I include myself in this. But how real is this excitement? Are we really at a point where we're in a kind of renaissance of making and new opportunities or really are we at some kind of uh, kind of the, the the last dying throes some last hurrah for an era where humanity uh, can consider itself uh, makers um, my background is teaching i love ta changing formats of teaching um, a lot of projects uh, take me outside university Different formats, I think, are critical. Changing format is critical. And we've seen a lot of trying to formalize open design. So is that something that I'm excited about? Yes, because it's a lot of deep thinking goes into it, but also it's worrying because it becomes formulas. Um, you do this, then you do that, then you get that. And I think that also makes you passive. Um, I've also, along the years, been involved in creating as many installations, in collaborations, um, talks in different locations, um, dealing with the kind of uh, end, a lot of uh, thinking through uh, making and then figuring out what happened there. Um, one of the experiments I added is the, was called The Incidental, was a physical digital blog that we, we tried out in 2009. Um, to, it's a user-generated opinion mapping uh, during Milan Festival Fair. It worked quite well. We had about 80% of the copy on the first day was us. By the end of the fourth day, it was 95% or even more generated by contributors that became the, the staff, in effect. Or, um, I ran a gallery for eight years, experimenting with different ways of communicating design. A lot of what I'm interested in is tangible, is the prototypes and experiments and how people investigate things uh, rather than the finished object. Um, but as a curator in a museum, um, a lot of times it's all about uh, the things that are, have been finished, that are performing in a, in, and communicating design, not to designers or to specialists, but to general public. And that's been the journey I've been doing in the last few years, is from working with highly specialized people, first as a designer, then as a, um, I guess, as a tutor at MA, PhD levels, or within BAs, or slightly going out and out all the time. Uh, currently, I'm very interested in actually how design is perceived or how to shift perception in general uh, audience. Um, and that brought me to this project, which I'd like to use in order to uh, think about making and what kind of times we're in. So Power of Making was a joint uh, commission. It's a joint project by the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Craft Council, 
uh, the British Ca Crafts Council, and they do a project every three years. And this project is called the Crafts Exhibition. And the first brief was called Craft Traces. There was a lot of conversation about what are the contemporary issues of craft and if that's the focus that is necessary. What I did is step back and look at the vision and mission statements of these two institutes. One was set up in 1851 after the Great Exhibition. The other in the 70s is the Crafts Council. I found in both the documentation this sentence, inspire future makers, this is what they're for. And so I found a common ground that I could, uh, a value that they are both committed to that I could focus on rather than talk about design or craft. So that became the focus, but really, in terms of today and, and also, I guess, in terms of uh, taking a position, which I think a lot of people here do, and, and it's very rewarding to hear people that are committed to a certain position and ideological. So in that sense, the, talking about this here is almost um, kind of uh, usually I try and talk to people that are not makers to see what the perception of making is. But if we look at the attitudes towards making, I mean, I can't really see all of you, but how many of you would say they are makers? Half? More? Three quarters? Okay. Uh, how many of you would say that government... Um, You would say that governments and the general public appreciate makers. So we have a problem. <laughs> no one lifted their hand. What do we do about this? Um, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. These are all issues that have been mentioned over the past few days, but just to remind ourselves and maybe gauge where you stand. Do you believe that the distance from production that reduced knowledge of material, diminished culture of, say, mending, deterioration of skill, are so far um, gone that there is, we have passed the point of return? Or do you believe that renewed interest in making, identity and belonging through participation, all these amazing things that we have seen in the last two days mean that we are in an era of renaissance and that maybe there is a massive shift and it's the end of the dictatorship of the machine. So this is the question. Are we past the point or are we really witnessing the end of the dictatorship of what, say, you can see in, in uh, Gideon, Gideon's book, Mechanization Takes Command, is this organizational structures that are built like machines. So when someone is, is, doesn't show up for work, the question that is asked is, what's wrong with them, as if they're apart? Not, are they, were they feeling all right? Does anyone know that? I mean, the first question is like they were a part of a machine. So just going through again, I don't know the answer, and power of making was set as a question to try and interrogate uh, the position and see what the public think about this. But um, if you think about what we know and what's happening, in some of these projects and some of these phenomena have been mentioned by many of the speakers, um, we haven't talked that much about abusive production um, or entrenched attitudes and what it does to employment, this whole um, massive independent open making. Um, but I think um, we have seen amazing projects from uh, people that are, are really involved in making viable propositions, not just uh, talking about wouldn't it be nice or could we do this, but actually delivering and, and this is uh, I think one of the most inspiring conferences in terms of actually seeing people that are on the, in the field doing things, interrogating intelligently but also thinking through making. Um, so, yeah. I mean, we're most of, most of, a lot of conversation around this subject. Um, and the exhibition tried to wake people up, really, and say, uh, listen, making is something that we can, most of us can do. And what's happened? Why is it that most people forget they can do this? What is this passive uh, behavior that this lack of knowledge or care about where things come from or how they're made? 
So in order to do this exhibition with an institute like the Victoria and Albert and the Craft Council, and in order to get move away slightly from the issue of craft, and, and I guess in relation to open design, the question here is what is the relationship between open design and making? So maybe we can use these key messages to think about um, does open design promote these things? And in that case, there is a very strong affinity with making. Um, the exhibition was built in a kind of way that, um, a bit like a Cabinet of Curiosity or an Aladdin's Cave, there wasn't a kind of zones or a way to go about the exhibition. It was very much left up to people's uh, curiosity. But there was a system of groups of things that shared um, a skill or a phenomena. Um, and uh, when you have, the, there were over uh, 105 lenders for this exhibition internationally, over 200 objects. This is, an, in terms of production of an exhibition at this kind of level, that's a lot. It pushed the team. Uh, anyone that's involved in museums will know that you need an amazing team of mounters and uh, uh, people that uh, understand what the materials, the, conserv the conservation is, is just and amazing and, and, and the people that publish, everyone seemed to be excited and work together. Um, when I started working on it, um, I, I come from a design background, so I kind of do the thinking and the, almost the design of the exhibition, and then I have to pull back to a principle of curating. Um, I started collecting things that interested me that had to do with ways things are made, but also physical aesthetic uh, associations between them. I really believe that there is an important thing that happens in our experience when two things start to uh, play off each other. Um, so, for instance, I was told I can, I'm allowed to use the laser. So that's a coffin, that's a cake. And that's a boat. So, but in terms of typology, there are things that start working. And how, the, how were they made? Um, how do makers think about shapes? Can we communicate to the general public? Is it interesting? Is it relevant? So I started looking at how things are made. And you know, we've seen uh, a very similar list earlier today in uh, the beautiful experiments that Anna was showing about types of uh, skills. But how do you order them in your head? So, um, in the Renaissance, they were talking about three types of making, and that's additive, subtractive, and shaping. And anything you look at is made in one of these ways. So this was cut out, so that's subtraction. And this was, um, um, that was cut out, that was connected, additive. And this was probably shaped. And you start looking at things in terms of how they're made, and that's how a lot of makers think. How am I going to make, I've got this idea in my head, this 3D thing or this object or it has to behave in this. You start playing with between techniques and materials, there's a fluidity of thought. Is that interesting for people to understand about design or making or craft? I found out that yes, very much. I mean, people really got drawn into looking at how things were made rather than by whom. Um, the other thing that I got into, and we've, we've had really interesting uh, conversations here about tacit knowledge, but in terms of making, it's kind of the, the Everest, you know, you're in that place where you're making, you're not even thinking about how you're doing it. If it goes wrong, you might even discover a new thing, you're, just, you're able to continue. There is some kind of very high level of making, which is super rewarding, but also it's one of the more creative conditions and tacit, tacit knowledge, tacit making, um, how do we get there? How do you teach someone or do you teach someone or can people get, uh, can everyone get to this level? Um, well, you know what, I think every person does something really, really well. It might be that they're very good coders, it might be that they make an awesome omelette, but people get to very, you know, they find something they're good at a lot of times, and it's very rewarding. And making is one of those places where you can get to these places, to this feeling and this control. But skills and control can't be the whole story. And uh, when you talk about making, I think the thing that gets forgotten a lot of times is the relationship with imagination. 
And when, after collecting all the skills and dividing them and then trying to find the best example for milling or the best example for um, every technique and maybe combinations, I, I kind of thought, wait a second, but that's not what this exhibition is about. It's really about what we do with these skills and who owns them and where is the knowledge, how do we learn them? And it was very clear that I'd have to find a way of dealing of, with this combination of imagination and skill. Now, I'm, I'm based in the UK, and in terms of uh, children's education, there is a very strong split. I don't know what you're experiencing where you see education for creativity, but technology and sciences and literature and arts, they're not fluidly taught together. Skills are taught separately, usually, than imagination. Um, and so this became my key criteria for the exhibition, imaginative use of skill. And that's the bit we get excited about when someone is doing something and, and suddenly something that unexpected happens or you see something you didn't think of yourself or someone is communicating in a way you hadn't thought, you hadn't seen or the imaginative use of any skill is the place where these little inventions, innovations, each person might be doing it by themselves, but they add up to this knowledge of making that no one owns, really, or should. Um, in terms of the exhibition, that was kind of quite a tall order, but what I tried to do, and with the help of a lot of uh, very experienced people that are called uh, people that deal with interpretation, they break down exhibitions and, uh, into uh, palatable bits. And, I was allowed 55 words on each object. You know, you go to visit someone in their studio and you know why and how, and, and then you get 55 minutes to write, 55 words to write about that, that's difficult. So there was a whole kind of a game of how to tell the stories of the process, how to, be, how to make the, the techniques and the imagination um, come out of the stories and so, there was a whole balance of the writing, the films, the, the atmosphere. Um, but in terms of technique of exhibition, you'll see there is a, one bigger label. So each of these are like a caption. So this whole area dealt with precision. And one of the, one of the items was taken as a kind of gateway object, it's called. It's the, something that you use in order to communicate about the whole group. But the story was more about the eye of the maker because at the end, after you make, a lot of times the most precise tool you have, and you'll see it, a lot of makers, doesn't matter in which area, they kind of look, car designers look like that, gun makers look like that, but they all use the eye and this precision, and the precision of putting two things together is an even higher level of precision. So, how can you bring people in to appreciate what goes into making? So this area was about accumulating knowledge. So none of these things, you can say who designed them or who, you know, the, the, how to make them has accumulated over centuries, but they're ingenious. They're really, there's a lot of knowledge in them. They're beautiful, they're really clever. So I was looking for a way to bring people in so there will be some freedom in walking around an open system, if you want, for an exhibition is kind of contradictory to a lot of institutes' uh, instincts. Um, so we had to kind of write how to go about the exhibition right at the beginning. And again, one of the things that anyone that is into does websites or communicates, you know the first paragraph is so fundamental, and we heard about the advertisers in their 30 seconds, but anyone that gives a name to a project knows that there is some contract happening very early on uh, between uh, the experience and the audience. Um, so I chose three, three um, concepts that were to run through the whole exhibition and they are meticulous, expressive and ingenious. And uh, at some point I thought I will divide the exhibition by meticulous object, really, really well-made things, like be things that 
what you call nutters in England have been doing, or geeks, or what, you know, this meticulous people that lose themselves in what they're making. The second group was expressive. It's kind of very expressive of your community or yourself, or really the uh, human expression at its most. And the third group was ingenious, so inventions and materials. Once I tried to plot out all the exhibits, I couldn't do it, because you can't divide, because you look at a piece like this, uh, ape or this uh, uh, taxidermy which is done in crochet, it's political positioning towards uh, taxidermy, crochetdermy, um, or this uh, quite amazing uh, gorilla made out of coat hangers, things we look at every day. David Mack looked at them a bit differently one day and thought, hmm, uh, I'll make a two and a half meter gorilla out of these. So there is some ingenious thing. Now, how do you do it? You need to be meticulous. And it's very expressive of the type of, of uh, I guess, uh, position that he takes as an artist. Um, again, trying to position things from very different disciplines. So this exhibition really included, stepped away from craft and away from design, included engineering, fashion, fine art, medical objects, all together. But because we were looking at how things are made, you can compare. Uh, nail art with um, um, a prosthetic hand. Um, again, in terms of shoes, you have amazing making, but you can draw out of this McQueen shoe. We weren't allowed to say who is the real maker, of course, because McQueen is a brand. So how do you manage to discuss that in the exhibition? You, you, do it, you talk about it in the symposium, you, or this other shoe, which was, uh, uh, it, it's, it's actually a guitar. Um, which is a performance working guitar that makes the whole, this kind of criticism about the whole macho guitar holding if you have to play very differently. And so you can bring a lot of stories out of objects that are there because of how they're made, but also start to unravel the meanings behind them. Throughout the exhibition, there were five thoughts uh, how, about learning a skill, um, and there were prosthetics, but this guy is a model maker. He is one of the best uh, prosthetic eye makers, but he's also, how did he start? He used to make kind of tanks and, and things like that. Uh, but he really, we, we visited his uh, um, laboratory and we filmed him doing things, and you'll see in a minute in the film. But this is a carpenter, a Brazilian carpenter, that discovered that he can, has the patience to carve the tips of, of pencils. Um, now, he does it, he discovered it as something he enjoyed to do, and he gives them to friends. But of course, this went viral online, and he became a kind of art commodity. Uh, but no, he didn't want to sell them. He kept it to himself for a while. He had that whole uh, pressure to become a kind of gallery artist, and he was a carpenter, but that would change his life. So the whole dilemma around what making um, and, and where it can position you, um, which, in which sector you are considered to be practicing. Um, playing with scale was another issue, so this is a kind of very traditional um, technique that was blown up, but one of the things we tried to do is not just mention skills, but give like a short, the, um, a short description, a 10, 10 word description in the handout so that when you walk around, you might walk away and you'd keep it with you and you'd go like, oh, I might try quilting, not just it's quilting, which is what most museums give you is just that quilting or joinery. Or, so just pulling out a bit, giving a bit more information. This went out, I guess it's a kind of, uh, it went out as a resource online and we were hoping that someone would pick up on it and add to it, and museums would start referring from their collections to it. We're trying to get that going. Um, and, of course, trying to bring people in to think about making. So we talked about the, the types of making, but you look at objects and you think, okay, after I thought about are they made by subtracting, adding, or transforming, which one is which? So, that piece of car is handmade. That's in Coventry in the UK, they hand make cars. That's kind of beaten into shape. That's uh, people that have a skill for 25 years, they pass it on. But, you know, they don't necessarily have to keep doing that. But the 
industry is dying, so are they going to lose that skill, or is someone going to come in and say, could you do this with your skill? Who's going to be that person? Um, other, other techniques, so this is uh, made in sugar and was made at night, eight hours before it was put on show. A chef uh, called Jackie came from Chicago um, and did it in the kitchen in the v and um, he, he, he uses glass techniques to make uh, sugar sculptures. Um, and he made it, and then he said, okay, now you can take it to the, it was, I think, 2 a.m. in the morning. He said, okay, now you can take it to the exhibition hall. And I was like, I'm not touching this. <laughs> and, um, but uh, it was just a lump of sugar that over eight hours became this thing. Now, he's using uh, hundreds of year old skills to do what he, his hobby is. He's also a pastry chef. Um, and whoever saw that film about um, the, the conditors from uh, France that will know that this is a very, also a very highly skilled territory, but this is his hobby, glass, copying glass techniques in sugar. Now, a sugar sculpture is not something you usually uh, encounter in a place like the Victorian Albert, nor are nails, nail art, nor is hair. Um, but in this context, suddenly it made sense. Suddenly it was about the knowledge of making and inspiring other people to make. And it wasn't so much about the provenance of this technique, should it be in a museum or not. So there was a kind of breaking of that type of, uh, I guess, uh, criteria. Um, a cake and a doll. Which one is which? So I'm going to jump, I mean, this is a territory that you're all very rehearsed with, uh, but I think it's relevant because people learn from different places. And I think one of the things that has happened, and we were trying to say in Power of Making, is that learning from people has become available again through technology. We had a barrier for whoever, uh, I've been involved in teaching uh, design, I guess, of around 20 years. About 20, 15, even 10 years ago, it was still about manuals. You'd still look for the manual, even if it was online. Now, you go for a person, as in the way that people that make dry stone walling learn from people. Something has flipped. And this flip, I think, is one of the biggest and most exciting. And everyone here knows that. You can now learn from people that are not necessarily next to you. And that's probably one of the most important changes that have happened. Um, and then what happens? How can we get to that level where it's not just about passing knowledge and everyone passing the same knowledge? When does it get turned into this wisdom of what it means, who is it for, um, when to use it? Um, so, for example, one of the areas was to compare the same typology made by in two different techniques. This is. Uh, uh, sponsored by Airbus, the first fully 3D printed uh, bicycle. This is a mahogany bicycle made by a boat maker in Japan who stopped making boats, started making these bicycles. They are both bicycles, obviously, but the typology, the, the shapes come from the technique in which they were made, but also each of them has little inventions in, in them in order to keep the, the weight of the mahogany bicycle very light, uh, and it's, it's called Superbike, and it is amazing to ride. It's, it's built out of sections, and the lacquering really is, comes from all the knowledge from boat making, the bending, the steam bending, went into this amazing piece. Um, a lot of knowledge went into the 3D uh, printed bike, and the motive for each one is very different. One kept his skills and tried to look for another field in which to uh, sell uh, his work, that's the wooden bike. The Airbus, the motivation of making the Airbus was to prove and to convince people that this is a strong material. Why would Airbus invest in a, in a bicycle? At this point you think, okay, they're investing in the development of, of new materials, it has transport, uh, but it allowed people to push, um, to push this typology. Um, and down here you see a bicycle which was made uh, in a bet between two friends. Um, about making a bicycle that had no glue in it and no screws, only wood. And so they challenged each other and one said, if you make a bicycle that's only 
made of wood, I will ride and uh, get you the world record for the fastest bicycle without any glue and screws. Of course, it's the only one. So <laughs> uh, they did get the record, though. Um, but these challenges, again, for a maker, what makes you go for something? What makes you invest? What motivates you as a maker? And even these stories, so what is the motivation behind making? Why do people make? Or is one of the more interesting conversation that I had, and I visited a lot of people and talked to a lot of makers from different areas and different techniques, and when you get to that conversation, you discover a lot of different reasons, but they're all choosing at some point to use the making to express themselves, to, to identify who they are, to think about the world, and even using the making to think directly. And this, I think, if I had to choose one thought from the whole exhibition, this would be it. And I think, to some extent, um, I think if there is a correlation with open design, there is this process in which things are changing, this iterative, uh, dynamic uh, um, zone in which you are thinking through making. And some people can do that only through making, and some people forget that this is an option. And I think one of our, or at least one of the roles I see for myself is really reminding people that there is a very special way of thinking and it's through making. And that's why I think when this exhibition finished, uh, it created a lot of debate. Um, over 320,000 people visited it during its 16 weeks. Um, and um, I was a few months later, trying to think, would that have been the case, say, 10 years ago? If we'd done this exhibition, say, 10, 15 years ago, would it have hit the same amount, same interest? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think, I think there's, there are things going on uh, beyond economic pressures. I think there are backlashes to relationships with, um, with big brands. There are uh, needs social needs that are now being pursued, again, through making. Um, but in terms of this whole drive for entrepreneurship and innovation, I think we mustn't forget that making is one of the most unique ways of discovery. Um, and so there was an area in the exhibition, a third of the exhibition was dedicated to people that uh, belong to what we call maker, the maker movement, um, people that share their ideas, that are in the process of discovery. And many of the things in this area were not highly finished in the same way that the things in the other areas. They are things that are in process, they're open. You know, a 3D printer that has all its uh, innards on the outside might be seen as ugly by someone who likes very finished carved uh, pieces of furniture, but they can't engage in the same way. They can't, and, and when you put these two things together, and you asked the other day about the aesthetics, is this, an, uh, do we not care about these aesthetics? Yes, we care about them a lot. I think this is the, the, these aesthetics are crucial to the communication of the meaning and the, the access. And so this whole area was a kind of, uh, almost a, a, an R&D department um, with, exhibits that were being used, and there's a bit of the history. This is the very, very first rep wrap that Adrian Boyer built, and when we asked to borrow it for the exhibition, he said, sure, there's only one condition, that one of you comes and builds the next one, and you show them next to each other. Because his whole idea is that you build one from the other, and so uh, one of the team members, uh, Domenico, went over for two weeks, spent two weeks in Adrian Boyer's lab in Bath University and made this machine which was working and making another piece, another machine during the exhibition. Um, the maker bot uh, of that era, two years ago, um, was uh, being used as was the up. And there was a whole discussion of which community, which audience is this for and where is it going to go? And we commissioned a series of signs from different techniques and technologies to reflect the values that, uh, or the attitudes. Um, there were, th um, whoever knows uh, the uh, wool filler project from Amsterdam or the spray fabric uh, from Imperial College, the Suguru, which are also uh, partners and co-founders to a fixed bridge project. Um, 
all this mix of uh, people that are fluent between digital and physical, I think that was the most interesting thing for people that haven't, are not makers, are not involved in this. This, uh, what I guess what Bruce Sterling calls the, uh, the future of making is in hacking the post-industrial milieu. It's going to be messy. This messiness between the physical and the digital, which we've seen some really good com proponents of. I think this is one of the most important uh, kind of uh, hopeful uh, directions. And so we tried to capture some of this, but also we try to uh, invite some people to think about making and its values uh, in education, in society. And uh, Neil Gershenfeld was talking in, in, about uh, the, the I, go, I guess, the most interesting aspect that came out was about the knowledge network, not the tools. And um, one of the things that we commissioned that was um, a, next to each object, there was a little poem by a Spanish writer called Patricia Rodriguez. We tried to capture uh, something of our very complex and, and sophisticated relationship with objects. Um, so this tacit relationship and to see a poem next to the technical information was exactly this relationship between skill and imagination. And to be able to do that in such a public arena was great. It showed amazing flexibility and I and, uh, think future is hopeful when a massive big institute like that allows for uh, this kind of... Um, and we come to the thing that I think everyone that makes knows, and it's kind of the biggest secret, uh, but it's also the free bit that I guess we need to tell people about. Um, so anyone that plays a, a musical instrument, anyone that makes knows this feeling of being in the zone. Um, and we tried to capture this uh, with a film that talked about this really, that, you know, when you're in the zone, you're so close up with the thing, with the material, with the movement. But when you pull out, you're part of this very big picture of knowledge, of making. When someone discovers something, it ends up say, in embroidery, it ends up in a bio implant many years later. How does that happen? It's very important that it continues. Um, and that's why open design is so critical. This openness of knowledge is not immediate, and people are saying, how do we monetize it? There is a much deeper, bigger picture here. Philosophically, I think it's a must. But uh, I'm going to run this film, which um, the brief to the filmmaker was um, the, Charles, uh, the Ray and Charles Eames film called uh, The Power of Ten which also influenced the thinking about the exhibition, which is about the connectivity between uh, the smallest molecule and the biggest star system.
Next to uh, uh, another area was uh, this big tinker uh, space. Um, this table, which was five meters long. Why am I talking to you? I have my own. Uh, this table that was five meter long was designed by a group called the Lultimo Grito and used a new technique of cardboard and resin. Two people, even one person can lift it. And imagine all the boardrooms, uh, instead of thick, massive mahogany that the cleaners can't move, is something you can push around. And it was used by tens of thousands of people um, to do all the program from embroidery to uh, casting, robotics, um, the whole range from physical to digital, the whole range of ages from about six to whoever was there. Um, and it was very busy. And next to it, in that area, was a series of films. Whoa, not that one, that one. Um, which was an open submission that we set up for people to send in one minute films of experimenting something. There were three rules. It had to start in black and end in black. It had to be an experiment of something they have made, and the making of the film had to be experimental. Um, we, got, we opened it for four weeks. We got 160 submissions. Uh, we chose 40. Um, this was, it's still online, if anyone wants to see it. It's, got, it's on Vimeo. Um, this is the area of the Tinker Space. And everything there, and it was an amazing program run by the Sackler Education and the contemporary team in the VNA um, that uh, really pulled in all the people that uh, we were hoping would attend. Um, and this is a, a program that we started that was developed during the exhibition using 3D tin and a, a bit for byte printer for children to learn to draw and sketch and print within three to four hours. And they were doing a little city. And the principle behind all of this was this, that we are trying to create access that will engage people to have an experience that they will be able to complete something and get confidence. And this uh, process is really, I think, one of the things that happens in all the amazing fab labs, make labs for so many people. And this is the thing that we have to be careful is that we don't enable this first stage where people are or don't understand. And then I think a lot of the questions over the last two days were about access to these amazing ideas, access to these amazing places in order to create engagement and an experience that will bring on confidence. Um, and the way I, I find to do it is to do an example, think about the principle. And this is the, also the way that I curate. I look for examples, I pull out to a principle. And this is kind of also in terms of teaching, design, curating, thinking, writing, this is kind of the movement um, that generated. So Fixpert is a, is a t kind of let's try it kind of approach that came out of it. And um, I think in order to make open design accessible uh, to more people, we have to really be immersed in making and, and, and in all the levels. And I think one of the, one of the questions that maybe are worth posing for next, the next conference is what role can making play in, make, in making, that doesn't, we have to work on the wording, but what role can making play for um, introducing open design to wider uh, communities? This was an attempt that, uh, again, I worked quite a lot with El Ultimo Grito. This was a series of um, experiments at next models of teaching design. Uh, we set up a gallery, in, there's a gallery in uh, Kingston University and it's a kind of research project about trying out other models than sitting around the table and teaching. Uh, and there's a series of experiments uh, that were documented. Um, I was invited to do uh, two sessions and I looked at these three terms. Um, and I, drew, I, I guess that relates to one of uh, Alistair's comments yesterday, the three A's that I'm proposing um, that are worth interrogating. And I don't know what the position that you take towards each one of them, but we've definitely seen authenticity becoming one of the things that people look for, but also one of the things that are being challenged. Authority, and I'm talking in this case from a position of design education or creative education. 
can we get rid of this model of the teacher in the class or can we mutate it or can we use new technologies to do this differently and are we going to be subjected to the same perception of authorship well obviously according to this seminar no and i think finally this is probably the most interesting concept for me as a reaction to uh, the conference um, uh, propriety, sovereignty, all these issues for me are down to the kind of position you take and as someone involved in teaching for um, about two decades there is one point that you look for as a, as a lecturer or a teacher is when a student stops being a student and that happens sometimes very late in the process sometimes it takes a few years down the line but this is the most important and most interesting point that uh, a good education system needs to think about accelerating. What is that point when someone th thinks and says, yes, I, this, I'm doing what I want, not what I need to do. Um, so I'd like to end with this thought and take my position in this question of uh, where we are. Thank you. I'm coming in quick, Daniel, with the, the seven A's theory. That's my three A's, agreement, agonism, antagonism. With your three A's, that's two triangles working together. Yours were authenticity, authority, and authorship. And the last A, the seventh A, is agency. And I think those two triangles, with the A of agency, really could be a kind of mantra for open I'm, I'm imagining someone running on the beach shouting, ah! Yeah, it sounds like that, but it could be a, a, a joyous ah, yeah. <laughs> and not a desperate ah. And I think we, we need uh, some good stories for open design, and I think we need quick ways of telling them too. So I think the seven A's theory is something we recognize in the debate of the last two days. So I give you my triangle, you give me yours, and we put agency in the middle and open it up to everybody here in the room. Thanks. We all know A is for Apple, though, <laughs> from school. But yes, I think that's, a, um, again, these are ideas, ways of thinking about things. I'm quite concerned about locking down on a theory, on a system. But if we do it for a bit and then we go on to a different system rather than B's, then I'm in. Of course, it's iterative. Hi, Daniel. It's me. It's here. <laughs> um, I have been recently asked the difference between an artisan and a maker. And I told them that, um, in my opinion, an artisan is someone who's very detail-oriented and more focused on the final product. And a maker is someone who's more experimental and is more interested in the process. And I'd like to know what your thoughts are mm. on that topic. I think art, artisanship can reach very high levels as well. I was, uh, it's, um, you know, look, look, for instance, if we think about a technique like carving that has had its, uh, you know, carved objects, um, what has happened to them when uh, traditionally they were so valued, it was the epitome of a, of a luxurious object, it then became and, and you knew exactly who had done it. And then, you know, um, at some point, and particularly in relation to Indonesia, for instance, we don't know who does this carving. It became the thing that modernism tried to pull away from, and artisanship became suddenly uh, associated with something uh, derogatory as kind of this decoration and, and itsy bitsy and not concepts. Um, now again we're accepting carving in a different way you know we see eight eight axis milling machines carving amazing things through digital artisanship um, so i don't know how to answer your question i, th I think um, there there's one thing about getting better at something and repeating it 
which in Western thought seems many times as something negative. Um, and that's back to the authorship issue. I think artisanship is a way as well for discovery. Um, it has a lot to do with how people that have that skill are perceived and, and, and treated. And, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at fixing. One of the interesting things is that when something is really well fixed, and, and uh, Glenn Adamson, the head of research at the Victoria and Albert, uh, writes about this, we, the perfect fix is something that is not there. So the better the, the, better the artisan, the better the quality, the less we know they're there. Whereas the maker, the designer, the artist, the more they're there, we kind of value it more. So I think it's a very interesting uh, question in the sense that we need to maybe rethink the perceptions towards these uh, differentiations. Are there any other questions? I think there were, there were about 50% of makers in the audience. More. More? And no more questions? I find that a bit odd. But maybe I can ask, um, what, what is the relationship for people between making and open design? Is it, a, is it a necessity that they are working together? Is it an essential part of open design? that making or thinking through making is critical, or is it kind of a parallel world? Actually, I was thinking along those lines when I was uh, listening to Sam's presentation, because I found it really interesting that, in a way, I mean, I don't know whether you considered yourself a maker or you had any affinity with actually making things before you started your experiment, but actually I thought it's really curious to see how your um, will to live uh, as open source as possible has actually turned you into a maker and you started ex uh, kind of exploring the ways in which you could make things for yourself in this particular way. So there's clearly some kind of relationship there uh, that bears exploring a bit more. I don't know if you'd like to expand on that. When are microphones it, going to be integrated to phones? It's, it's definitely a um, kind of positive feedback loop, like Daniel showed with the um, uh, access engagement moving on to uh, inspiration, because once you kind of see, see yourself do it once, then you realize that it's, it's possible. It's not just you know, some genius creating something. Um, there's actually a, a whole lot of very small steps with many mistakes and failings along the way. Um, and once you see that whole process and you understand it, then a whole lot more is possible than, than previously. So I think that's a real um, big aspect of the, uh, the making process that really, once you've done it once, it's difficult to stop. Okay, it might be difficult to stop, but we do have to stop at some point. Uh, thank you again, thank you. Daniel. Thank, thank you. you very much.